What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode on the You Don't Own the Lake podcast. We've got a really special and very interesting guest for you guys on the podcast today. Somebody that you might not expect to see on my podcast, given what this guy specializes in. But we've got Adam Cook with Nautical Pride Sport Fishing over on the East Coast in Virginia, mainly on the James River. Just absolutely crushing a big catfish over there. Full-time guy, just like myself, uh, and also a tournament fisherman. And that's a couple things that we're going to talk about in this episode, as well as some electronics in the catfishing world and uh, the brand new format in the tournament world on the catfish side that those guys desperately needed so badly that uh, Adam was able to be a part of. So looking forward to some interesting talks. Uh, Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below and hope you guys enjoy the episode. All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to another You Don't Own the Lake podcast. We've got a really, really fun, super special guest tonight. Um, guy that I'm just meeting now for the first time. We've talked a couple times on Facebook. We're just like-minded fishing guide individuals and um, really looking forward to talk to him. But we've got Adam Cook with Nautical Pride Sport Fishing out on the East Coast, the Southern East Coast. Um, I'm not even sure where, maybe Virginia or something like that. But we'll just let Adam introduce himself and, um, you know, just kind of give me a little bit of background about how long you've been doing what you're doing. Um, got a lot to talk about as far as like the tournament scene i know you just got done with the first like major league catfishing tournament so i'll be curious to see but yeah fire off just a little kind of situation of whatever you know your background is as far as where you're from and how you got started especially into guiding um big cat guiding so go for it yeah so you know for a lot of your typical viewers um and the species that y'all are in uh, you know, some people may be rolling their eyes when they hear people talk about catfishing as a sport fish, you know, um, I know my dad, for example, you know, he thinks catfish are just kind of a trash thing. He doesn't really understand it, but that's just not the error that he was brought up in really. But either way, uh, hopefully we can change the perspectives on that and give a, um, a different aspect to the sport because it is a sport especially on the trophy end of the aspect. But I'm Adam Cook, owner and operator of Nautical Pride Sport Fishing. Uh, We got full-time, 365 out here on the James River. Typically, uh, we fish Bugs Island, uh, the Rappahannock River, which are tidal fisheries. Much different than what you have on the Missouri, Mississippi, Ohio, Tennessee River, where it's uh, free-flowing. Our tide basically turns around every six hours. Um, for those that don't know what a tidal fishery is long story short. Um, but we've been full time now for about four years. Um, really in reality, I got into guiding purely just cause I wanted to pay for my habit. Um, always love fishing. Uh, it's just always something that I've been into, you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, we did a little bit of hunting and stuff like that, but never really quite did it for me. Like being on the walk. Just anything involved being around on the water uh, was just something that I was always very passionate about. And anybody that's out there fishing, fishes every weekend, fishes daily, whatever you do, you know it's expensive. So that's pretty much how, you know, or my motivational factor to going going forth and making it a business venture. Um, We've been doing full-time, though. I started business about seven years ago. We've been full-time for about four years. I'm actually a welder by trade. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, what'd you do before? Yeah, I was a welder by trade. Did that for, you know, pretty much since I was a teenager. Um, And I was, I'm kind of one of them guys that I've always bounced around. I'm not really what you would call a company man. And at first I didn't really know what that was about. I just never really was happy you know, staying at one place for too long. I'd get bored. I'd ready to go to another job. Um, I did a lot of independent contracting in the welding field. And it got to just the point to where I think really what pushed me is I was just tired of working for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, at the time, I didn't know that, but I was in a good place financially. Um, We had already developed a pretty good name as far as being a reputable uh, guide service, you know what I mean? We had a good name going for us and I knew they were getting ready to do some laying off and I knew there was other people that needed work more than I did. And I just kind of went in there one day and 
I just told him, I said, hey, look, I know a layoff's coming. I know there's probably other people that want to stay and want to keep the job. Um, but I, I'm okay if y'all want to go ahead and just, I can make your decision easy. I'll, I'll take a layoff. And from then on out, I kind of laid low for a week or two and I just started advertising more and really started, you know, trying to market the business side of things. Cause before we were just part-time and I have, I kind of feel like if you have a full-time job, I don't know that it's, I'm not going to say it's right or it's wrong. In my opinion, I don't think that you should be trying to impoach on anybody else that's full-time. Yeah. Um, I agree. That's just my opinion. It doesn't make it right or wrong. Don't hate me for it. But if you have a full-time job, you don't really have to take the trips. You know what I mean? Right. If you get them, cool. But either way, we started advertising and really in reality, I haven't had to even think about picking up a welding rod since then. Um, it just kind of fell into place and it's, we've been blessed really. And there's yeah, no man. other way to say it. It just, everything, the timing, you couldn't have planned it any better. It just worked out. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of my backstory. And right now we average probably about 230 days on the water professionally, not excluding tournament fishing or just overall just going out scouting xyz sure yeah that's i mean that's a great story too i mean we we're i was just talking to my buddy on our on our podcast from last night kind of about just like how we came up and where we where we came from as far as like what we all did before fishing full-time which i mean i feel like a lot of people kind of romanticize the idea a little bit too much of Oh yeah. Fishing full time, like, oh my God, it must it's a dream job and this, oh, yeah. that, and the other and stuff. I'm like, man, it's still a shitload of work. Okay. And it's Absolutely. like not just a shitload of work, but it's a shitload of just the mental side of it. You know, it's like for you especially, like, gotta play the tide. What are the fish gonna be oh, doing? Yeah. What's this? What's that? You know, it's it's a lot that weighs heavy on you, especially when you got kids and stuff at home. Um, oh yeah, for sure. You know, it's not people say that all the time to me they're like man this is the dream job and you know it's not the most physically demanding job that i've ever had obviously sure. there is some physicality to it but mentally i have put more into this and worked harder doing this than i have anything else yeah I mean, that's is, great man it is uh definitely mental mentally exhausting at times yep like you said uh, yep. You just have the overall what the fish are doing from day to day, and then of course you know titles, um, all that stuff is just it adds another another spectrum to it. And as far as like you know having having a family to provide for, you know this is a recreational job really. It's not yep. something that people have to go and take a guy out to you know tell him how to fish or to have a good time. So you know there's times where it, it that kind of stuff definitely weighs on the stress factor of you too yeah big time but you know at the end of the day it's like life could be worse you know we're going oh, fishing yeah. every day oh yeah absolutely 200 plus days a year for any fishing guide is you know top tier type stuff and oh, i mean yeah. i run myself ragged and i'm on the water way more than i probably should be and i'm probably going to try and reel it back a little bit next year to just be at home more and maybe even focus more like on the content side of it but i mean i'm pretty blessed too where i live you know five minutes from the the boat landing here on the main lake that i got on how far are you like from where on the james river and are you're in virginia right yeah virginia yeah so i'm i'm as far east as you can go oh, really okay. before you hit that salt water line sure yeah that's what i was gonna ask so so because we are connected to the atlantic ocean you have not only you know all the other variables that you would typically have but you also have a freshwater fish that is landlocked by salt water. Mm -hmm. You know, now they will breach out a little bit. You know, sometimes they'll test the waters, but they can't, these fish can't live in salt water. Yeah. So I'm as far east as you can go as far as freshwater fishing. And, and I we're talking, we're talking big blues, right? Big blues. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Dude, now, so on the upper what... end of our rivers, we do have flatheads, you know, channel catfish, white catfish, stuff like that. But our flatheads are actually angler stocked. Funny story. They, the, the game department never stocked a flathead here. Uh, there is no physical way possible 
that through flooding or any way that flatheads could have ever entered our body of water. So mm. the flatheads that we have were actually brought here by, by anglers. Or we call, we call that a bucket biologist. <laughs> yeah, a bu- yeah, exactly. Um, which I actually learned that last year. I thought that they were the native fish here and maybe the blues had just kind of encroached on territory and wiped yeah. them out. That is, it's not the case. I mean, That's actually wild. in reality, we have a pretty good flathead population. If you think about that, I mean, how many, I guess the nearest flathead native water would be three hours. I mean, that's Man. a pretty, that's pretty demanding for somebody to go catch those fish and then bring them somewhere else. Yeah. Big time. And yeah. then, and then they thrive, you know? Yeah. yeah absolutely. I mean, you know, I, it was like one on picture. Roof. I don't know. I'm trying, I was like trying to think of the picture I might use for the thumbnail of this podcast. There's just this <laughs> one. I haven't even looked it up, but I just remember in my head from your Facebook, it was a giant flathead. It might even oh, been yeah. at night. Oh yeah. I mean, we're like 80 pounds. Maybe that fish was actually like 55. Oh, see, that's dude. It's so funny that you say that because every flathead that I've had in my boat over 50 pounds, I thought it was for sure like nine, 80 or 90 oh, yeah. pounds because I'm just not seeing, I'm not used to seeing a catfish that big because I just don't do it. I mean, I know that they exist. We catch them on accident. I got buddies that fish the river, fish big, big blues. I've caught a 58 pound blue on the Kansas River here, five minutes from my house, too. But even those, I mean, the flatheads are just different. Like when the, when that fish comes up for the first time and you see its head and it's oh, like yeah. this wide and I'm like, it's a 90 fucking pounder. <laughs> get the, get the fisheries biologist here. We need a certified scale. And then they're like, oh yeah, it's just a good one. It's 55. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That's like that last blue that we caught on bugs. Hey, you know, I'm not a stranger to larger fish. We caught three over a hundred pounds. I'm very aware. Yeah, I was I was gonna segue into how many fish you have over 90 or 100 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Ex- excluding that one. And when I saw that fish, I mean I knew it was a good one, but when we finally put that fish on the deck and he stretched out of the net, I instantly I was like, Yeah, he's he's 120. I'd already, you know, I knew he won a world record, but I knew yeah. I was like, I, in my heart, I was like, he's 120 all day. That's insane. And then we weighed him and he was only 105 you know but <laughs> only skinny. 105 yeah he was a very skinny fish. oh okay man yeah. that's crazy but yeah i mean sometimes it's hard to look at those fish and i mean even when you look at them all the time and it's like yeah i'm pretty close but when they get over 80 you you don't know until you put them on the scale you really don't that's like I mean, for me like it, i compare fish like that you know i mean with any fish they get to a certain size and they just become like a different, a whole different animal, like a whole different class of fish, like walleyes over 30 inches or muskies, for example, up North, like, you know, 50s, the magic number 55 even, but those are just like, I mean, like Wisconsin walleyes that are 30 inches that are that big, like behind me, that fish is probably 20 years old. And then flatheads, for example, I mean, the only reason I know what like a 55 pound flathead would be aged at is because the first one that we did catch on accident, I did call the fisheries biologist because I thought, well, we do. My client now has the lake record because no one's ever recorded one. And most of them were caught on trot lines. But I know that a 55 pound flathead is between 28 and 30 years old in this yeah. part of the, the country, you know, because they have yeah. a, a much faster or a much longer growing season versus you know other places up north like on the mississippi where you know it's that water's pretty cold so but yeah just seeing up like i said i've got a couple buddies that fish the missouri river and you know if they're if they catch a 40 or 50 they're probably not even going to take a picture of it but they're out there for that 90 to 110 pound fish and there's been a few over 100 that's just i couldn't even imagine seeing a fish that big caught on a rod and reel it, it is you know with the exclusion, well, let me say this. They're all special, but I'll say that there hasn't been one fish that I've caught until I got him in the boat that I realized he was that big. You know, usually, you know, they always grow 10 to 15 pounds from the time they're in the water to the time they're in the boat. But sure. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, obviously, you know, you kind of, in my case, become desensitized where you you see that big fish in the water you know you're almost like okay well it's a good one you know he's he's 70 or so obviously we want to catch him it's not like we're not gonna try to 
yeah. and everything you can to get him in the boat. But of course, it doesn't really hit you until you go to pick him up out of the water. Yep. And then you're like, oh, he, he's a little bit bigger than 70. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's awesome, man. So what's, uh, I mean, I'm just, I mean, I have no like frame of reference. Cause I'm originally from Wisconsin and moved to Kansas 20 years, some, some 20 some odd years ago now, as far as like the patterns and stuff go. So, I mean, we're just now, and this is kind of what I was talking to my buddy last night about too, where like this time of year for us down here is just like, a, can be a really weird transitional time of year. Cause the fish are out of the winter patterns water's warming up we got a lot of rain or a lot of water coming in from the feeder creeks we got a lot of rain it's muddy it's clear water temps are up and down fronts rolling through east northeast winds here for the last like three days and not you know ongoing that affects us a lot but on a tidal what body of water like this time of year how does that affect what you would do on a day-to-day -day basis or how you fish? I mean, is it all the same? You just go get some skipjack and go to your favorite spots and throw them out or what kind of factors play into that? So, and this time of the year is probably the most trying. Yep. Uh, of course you have the fall, <laughs> the fall turnover as well. Yep. But that isn't as bad in my opinion, most years. Mm -hmm. Spring though is just always a bitch. Mm -hmm. It's a love hate relationship um especially right here in the mid-atlantic i would maybe think that up north it might be a little bit more consistent i could be totally wrong by that but here i mean you just you catch it from all different directions i mean it's never the same wind direction um in this case we never really got a winter you know we only had about three weeks that really let those fish dial in they were all in one area like they should be you know, and it was great. It was your typical epic winter bite. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, and that only lasted about three or four weeks. And ever since the beginning of February, which is, you know, very untypical. I mean, it's been a constant grind every single day, searching for fish and then hoping that they're active. Yep. And it's not even just seeing fish on the graph and seeing them staged around structure seeing them staged right into the current and saying, okay, well, those are feeding fish. I know my bait's pretty close to them. You know, they're still not biting. So, you know, what is it? You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, it could be presentation. It could be whatever it is. It's just a very trying time of the year. We're out of the week with all these fronts. You might get two, three good days. And the rest of the time, it's going to be a grind. And it mm -hmm. just is what it is. There's nothing that you can do about it. Yep. Um, you know, you'll see little, I, I know why a lot of people like the spring. Cause you'll have these random little pods of fish that'll just randomly become active. That shouldn't even be there in the mm -hmm. first place. And people think it's great. Cause if you're from a novice standpoint, that very basic, you know, I'm just going to go set up on this channel edge where there's some bait and that fish might come through and eat, you know yep. what I mean? Uh, but for somebody that revolves around patterns and expectations, and I know you can't really expect anything in fishing, but I expect when I see those fish that I may at least get an opportunity. Um, so, you know, when you have all this weather going back and forth, you know, sometimes those expectations just go out the window. Like, oh, we see them there. That fish is probably about 50, 60 pounds, but will he bite? Will he not? You know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I go through the same thing in March here until we get kind of more into April where it's like every day is better to be lucky than good. Some days, yeah. you know, it's like you do whatever you can do and luck into, like you were saying, random pods of fish that maybe shouldn't have been there, but they were, and we happened to be there and they wanted to eat for a half hour, just like today yeah. with the hybrid striped bass or the wipers, as most people call them, you know, it's like, this can be a really weird time. They're following the white bass up the river for a false spawn because hybrids are sterile and they won't spawn, but they'll still try and go through the motions. They're scatter spawners. So a lot of them are going to stay in the lake. A lot of them are going to go up the creeks and there's just so much life in the lake and the walleyes are getting ready to think about moving up here and spawning in the next couple of weeks. So, I mean, every, every, it's just like, it's just a really weird time. So I, I wake up every day. I set the bar really low for everyone. <laughs> we just go out and give it hell. I mean, like I said, we've got this, East Northeast wind blowing the last couple of days and will for the next few days, coupled with a lot of rain. And, um, 
to have more than one or two days of an east wind here in the midwest is kind of weird and makes things super tough yeah. and i guess that kind of leads me to my next point you're the right person to ask this question wind from the east fish bite the least wind from the west fish bite the best i always tell people that that statement in the midwest is bullshit because it mostly only applies to tidal waters yeah is there any truth to that so no it does not Good. in my That's what opinion I say too. <laughs> it, it does, well the thing is too with guides it, we don't have the ability to i mean obviously you need to watch the wind you need to be very cautious even though sometimes for us we've been doing it a while subconsciously we probably might take these things into account but it doesn't mean anything because we still have to go out there and fish. Yep, that's right. It's not like, oh, well, it's the east wind today. I'm not going out. Yeah. You know, sorry, we're going to cancel. Yeah. No, you the can't barometric pressure is too high. We're not going to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to go, especially when somebody books a year out, three months out. You, you know, bet. you got to go. Um, but the wind direction, in my opinion, does not mean anything. It just means what's going to be accessible to us. Yep. How well we're going to be able to fish certain areas. Um. The other day, for example, you know, the weatherman was completely wrong. It was supposed to, we got out there that morning. It was 60 degrees, flat, calm, beautiful day. I said, man, this is going to be great. I don't know how we're going to catch them, but I know the conditions are going to be favorable. Well, he was right for about two hours and we ended up somehow the weather shifted and we got North Carolina's weather. Mm. And we got a gale wind out of the east that was blowing like 35 which on a lake, it, well, anytime you're on any body of water and it's going 30 miles an hour, it's going to be bad. Not that fun. But, no. <laughs> yeah. But much less when you have currents that conflict each other. And our, our river runs from west to east. Yep. So depending on which way the tide's going at that present time, one way or another, the wind is going to get you. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened the tide was going out and the wind was coming east. So they collided. And I was kind of wondering, I could tell it was getting a little windy, but we were shielded from where we were at that time. And it was time to go. I come around this big oxbow and I slowly progressively just see it getting a little rougher, a little rougher. And I'm like, what the heck's going on here? And by the way, we destroyed them. You That's know, great. And I, didn't That's I didn't realize it was an east wind. Oh, I didn't realize it was okay. any, because just the way we were sitting on that bank, we right. were shielded from it. I didn't realize that till we came around the bend and we came mm -hmm. around the bend. And then I realized, I said, Holy crap, it's really blowing. And, uh, we actually went through some pretty sketchy stuff, but that's, I wasn't aware that it was blowing out of the East, but I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, a East wind, a West wind, a North wind. All that means to me is that the fish might do something a little bit different. If it's coming out of the North, you know, we actually have a high pressure system coming in or a south wind, which typically implies for us a low pressure system, which isn't always like that, but typically, right. you know, with those south winds, it's low pressure. North, it's going to be hot. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, it may change something, a tactic that I may do. You know, if I'm going to get a, a north wind, I'm going to get a nice front that's going to come through. I'm probably not going to pull planer boards. I'm probably not going to troll for fish because they're going to be a little bit tighter to the bottom. You know, so it just kind of changes the things that you do and yep. how you target fish. Um, you might have to pull out some extra tricks, you know, go through extra couple extra loops throughout the day. But that you just you pull out your jug lines and just go set them and then go check them later. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. No. Um, although I'll tell you, you know, uh, back in our early years, you know, I don't think jug lines are very ethical at least how it's more predominantly known yeah but i'll tell you you know <laughs> this is actually a funny story i'm not afraid to admit it now setting jugs in my early years actually helped me really understand my electronics mm. uh and that's when my game really changed and went to another level because you know i'm riding around and you know this is around the 2000 and uh 12 phase maybe about the time that side imaging started really coming out you sure. know it was actually a little bit earlier than that yeah but just a little bit i got my much, hands yeah. on it mm -hmm. and you know i'm i'm riding through here and you know i'm seeing these fish scattered out here and i say well you know typically that's also like i said it just helped me learn typically catfish won't school up by the thousands 
you know, so when I'm seeing a bunch of big rice patties, you know, rice pods everywhere, you know, at that time I was thinking I've hit the mother load, but I'd throw these jugs out and all I would catch is gar, hmm. you know? So then I was saying, okay, well, when I see this, it's gar. Yep. When I see this, okay, it's carp. When I just see a few singular ones here and there, then I'm catching catfish. Big time. You know, so really in reality, you know, some people might not like that answer, but it is what it is. Um, I'm not ashamed of it. You know, setting jokes no. in my earlier years totally took me to another level with electronics and really gave me confidence to call shots and say, okay, well, that fish is 40 feet. You know, that fish is 80 feet. This is what 80 feet is right here. I'm going to set this right here and I'm going to catch this fish or I'm not going to catch them, you know? So it, it really, really, really took me to another level um, and gave me a competitive edge. You know, now electronics, everybody's using them. Everybody's got the best electronics, you know, but there was a time period for a while that it was, you know, it was next level. You know, it was hard to compete with somebody that really was proficient at using, you know, their depth finder to find fish and actually target them and catch them. Yep. Well, and I mean, it's like that was back when side imaging first came out. Now with all the live imaging and stuff, it's like, oh yeah, same difference. I mean, yeah. you got to be, you got to know how to be deadly with it for you to yeah. be worth a shit. If you've got ten grand plus worth of graphs and live imaging oh, yeah. setups in your, I boat. see it all the time. And I don't know if you do this, but do you ever have people that want you to go out on their boat to God? To, well, uh, yeah, unfortunately there are some guys that say, can we do this in my boat? But yeah. I do do electronic sessions, you know, two yeah. hour little deals where I hop in their boat. But yeah, as far as like fishing guiding, I've had a few people ask me, but no, I don't do that. <laughs> well, essentially the, the electronics yeah. thing, you know, yep. I get on people's boats all the time that have spent bukus of money, more money than I got in my setup. Yeah, I do this professionally. Yeah. And I hop on there and they've just got more money than they have brains. You know, having yeah. that technology is great, but if you can't utilize it and you don't understand it, it does Worthless. absolutely nothing for you. Yep. Yeah, it's true. Well, that that jug line story is a super good point. Um, and just a really good perspective from just like you were saying, and I've I've done this over the years too is just being able to identify what's what. Cause yeah. just like you said, you put the jugs out cause you see a shitload of fish on side imaging. Then you get the first five fish and they're all gar and you're like, all right, cool. Those are gar. And I have to do yeah. the same thing. And now, I mean, live scopes made it really easy for me to just say, that's a, that's a wiper. That's a white bass. That's a crappie. That's a, a walleye just based on how they interact with my bait or mm -hmm just how they're kind of swimming through the column and what their, their, how their body undulates and stuff. But I just, I just don't think is what a lot of people pay attention to. Cause I get questions all the time, especially on the walleye side of things where people are like, what do walleyes look like on down imaging? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> we, just, you know, I mean, they're on the bottom, <laughs> but so are sheephead and catfish and whatever else, you know, wipers and white bass hang out on the bottom too. But Sometimes it's just a matter of marking a bunch of fish and then you just happen to catch one and then you happen to catch another and be like, all right, yeah. cool. You know, same different or same thing like you were saying. <laughs> well, the now one I know thing how white have... bass set up on a, a channel edge or, you know, whatever, what have you. So that's a good point just for, I'm not telling everybody that's listening to this to go set jug lines when they mark a bunch of fish, but. Absolutely not. That's, that's uh, not what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, no. Well, one thing that there is at a benefit versus what you do typically and what i do is that and this is a tail end to what we were saying we can move on to something after that but a catfish does not have a lot of bone has no scales really the only hard part in that fish's body is its head and you're only going to pick the skull up on a very large fish you know what i mean you're talking about one over 50 60 pounds mm -hmm. um the walleye striper well we have striper y'all have wipers yeah. yep crappy they're all scaled fish very bony fish so you know on that was another thing as far as learning that you know i'd ride over fish and see them on my 2d or my down imaging and i would see some were really bright yellow and some were not bright yellow and mm -hmm. some would have a little bit of orange in them you know that's the one thing that helps me 
and I don't really use 2D a whole lot. 90% of the time I'm looking at my side imaging, just yep. looking specifically for fish. But when I am fishing, you know, in the fall and summer, when those fish are on bait really hard in the middle of the river, I don't have to guess if it's a gar, if it's a carp, if it's a striper, because a catfish will never show up as a hard return. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the way that we can really easily identify, you know, what we're looking at or what we're not looking at. And I know if it's a hard return, I'm not interested in any way because I'm not a striper guy, we, even though we do some sight casting for striper. Sure. But that's a little bit, I'll find those in different areas. Mm -hmm. You know, those times of the year, I'm just not going to see striper there. Yep. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another really good point, too. And I mean, that's like definitely uh, something that I was going to bring up, too. It's just the electronics aspect of being a cat fisherman and just how to use that. Because I see pictures that my buddies post, you know, they'll, they'll post like the left side of their graph and, you know, you'll see two shadows, but they're two giants, you know, sitting yeah. over there. And a lot of people have no idea what they're looking at. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to bring up because I, I generally will tell people too when we're talking about electronics, you know, just get comfortable with learning how to read traditional sonar, 2D sonar and down imaging and side scan, get your bases covered before you just jump right into live scope, because yeah. how are you going to get to those fish and find them in the first place? Are you going to put live scope down right at the boat ramp and <laughs> idle out of the Marina with live scope down and just start looking that no, yeah. but you know, ever since down imaging, I just, especially down here, not so much up North. Cause I know a lot of guys, even especially when they're pulling a spread of crankbaits, like on green Bay on Lake Michigan, that pretty much all they use are salmon guys too, up there. All they're using is 2d sonar. I don't see a lot of guys that use down yeah. imaging and it's because they know how to read the returns of those fish based on how hot they are or how cold they are and just the general size and being able to see stuff like that. So that's a really good point. Just talking about relatably just the size of the fish the mass of the fish they got scales they got no scales you know yeah. whatever what have you so super good point there yeah but, absolutely um i guess we'll kind of segue that into uh your boat just because i'm always i mean i see them this is a really good time a year right now um this is i would kind of compare this to your like maybe january february blue cat bite where you may be getting them pretty shallow or they're real aggressive, but here that's like, that's kind of the phase that we're in on these reservoirs right now, where I got buddies on my local lake here that I got on that are catching 40 or 50 pound blues in two or three feet of water. Yeah. And I see, I mean, I'm kind of back in the timber too, just following these fish up and down the river channel all the way back to the, the river itself through all this timber. And I see these, you know, giant 20, 22, 24 foot sea arcs or, easy cats or whatever just ripping through the trees to go back to where these blues are or whatever but all that was to say i'm enamored by your giant catfish boat and i'm really jealous of your full enclosure i'm thinking about adding the sport top to my my new lund here in a couple months maybe last minute just so i can I say was, i have it <laughs> i was hoping you were still gonna have your wind dirt cheeks when i saw you post your tag for your show earlier oh no uh, well i mean I got so much light on me right now. I probably don't look as red, but man, I'm telling you that East wind today was a mother and yeah. I'm feeling pretty red, but I, my wife has gotten me a lot better at, uh, every morning before I leave, put a couple dabs, a little sunscreen right here yeah. just on my nose. So I'm, I don't look as red. That, uh, that enclosure, man, you know, I've kind of evolved over the years and, you know, at first, and you've probably been this way too, is you always think you know what you want at that time, mm -hmm. you know, and as your experience level changes and as you spend a little bit more time out there, you say, ah, oh, well, I think I want this or I want this. And I've evolved from, you know, John boats to cutty cabins, to skiffs, to just about every kind of boat that you can have. Um, and till we got to, you know, we're at the level now where I know storage is an important thing. I know being out there in rough water at times is an important thing and getting people back safely. I know that that windshield is a huge contributor. That enclosure is a huge contributor to my success yep. and being less fatigued on the water mm -hmm. and keeping people happy, of course. For sure. Um, 
you know, and I, I've done, I've done it with less for years, but I told myself two years ago, I'd never fish off another skiff during the winter. And I told myself last year that I never fish another winter without an enclosure. And I don't even have buddies on my days off now. They're like, come on, man, let's just, you just hop on my boat for the day. We'll just go run around. I'm like, I look at the forecast. I'll see it's below 40. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> I'm good, man. <laughs> you can go up here. We can get on my boat, but I'm, I'm not doing it no more. Yeah. Uh, it, that thing, I understand that it's not feasible for everybody, but that is such a game changer. Mm -hmm. you know, for this time of the year, yep. Um, getting your people out of the elements, yourself staying out of the elements. Of course, this year we didn't really have a winter, but the days that it was bitter cold, it was very, very nice to have that um, accessible to us. Yeah. So um, that's on what, uh, what do you have a 22 or 24? That boat's boat? technically classified as a 22 foot boat. Okay. It's got a uh, eight foot beam on it. Very wide boat. Um, it's actually a 24, but they call it a 22. Sure. And it, um, it's a sea arc, isn't it? Or yeah, no? Sea arc dynasty. Yeah. yeah. That boat, <clears throat> you know, we were getting ready to upgrade things and it's going back and forth on what we wanted to do exactly. I looked at a lot of different boats and ultimately what sold me on that boat was the duck bill overhang on the front. Um, oh, yeah. you know, you have just a little bit more deck space, which, mm -hmm. We don't do a lot of crappy fishing, but that is something that I'd like to get into this year. Sure. So having that bigger front deck for people to be up there, put two pedestals up there was is was nice for me. Mm -hmm. um, when you can get yeah. up there with the cast net too, and not yeah. have to you know have be all cramped up there. Oh yeah, catching bait that that big overhangs a breeze. Um, of course, the windshield that seals off that's a game changer. Uh, with or without the enclosure just mm -hmm. having that big windshield is, is killer oh yeah um the amount of storage that's in that boat it you don't really see many aluminum boats that have a bunch of storage that's the one thing about aluminum unfortunately but that boat has compartments everywhere um, well, you should, course, you should, i'll show you maybe we can do this again and i'll show you or i'll just come out there i'll show when danny wraps my new lund that i've got coming right. we'll talk about aluminum boat storage because the new 2023 <laughs> is like like you were saying in those sea arcs like everywhere you look there's some random drawer pop out yep. thing where you can put stuff <laughs> that's that's awesome by the way i i want to congratulate you on that that's that's a thanks big man deal, man yeah, that uh, this podcast might screw it all up because sometimes I swear, but I like to think that I'm still a professional, even though I'm, sometimes I'm kind of unprofessional. You know, but it, it's it's nothing wrong with being professional, but we're at a time now to where being real, I think, speaks a little bit more. Um, it, I think tiptoeing around sometimes. I think you can be too professional, and it'll hurt you. It's cringy, I'm not man. I see. And I'm not it, saying be a trashy. I'm not saying be trashy and. Right. Yada, yada, yada. There's a, there's a fine line between, you know, just being yourself and being trashy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think people appreciate that. I, I do. Uh, especially with the way that social media has affected the fishing industry. Yeah. Um, Tell me about it. <clears throat> it. It's a good and bad thing, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily, if you say a bad word, you say a bad word. Nobody's perfect. You know, I know. I always just think that's funny when I get comments like that on the YouTube channel sometimes. Oh, where it's yeah. like, I'm unsubscribing because you're unprofessional because you said shit. Yeah. <laughs> shit, shit, shit. No. Or you like just, to throw your own. It's just funny. But yeah, no, the uh the Lund deal's cool. Um super humbled and still can't even believe it's real. But it's just gonna be a long two month wait waiting for that boat. Um do you have are you working with Sea Arc or no? No, no, I'm not working with Sea Arc. Um, that was, I'm not going to lie to you. Beyond the performance aspect, storage, certain little things here and there that I really like about the concept, um, you don't have a lot of boat manufacturers that are very. Well, th the fact is, catfishing isn't super mainstream yet either. Yeah. It's getting there. We're in a good, we're headed in the right direction. Um, but you don't have a lot of manufacturers that have hands have hands in the industry. Mm -hmm. sure. And even even boat builders that are building boats for the industry, they're not really involved. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They're doing other things. Uh, 
so the the possibility i'm not saying it will happen but the possibility of a partnership could be very real you know sure. somebody who's actually involved with the industry oh yeah i would i would be lying if i said that wasn't a selling factor on on buying their brand yep um beyond the performance aspect because i mean i wouldn't have bought the boat if i didn't believe in it either of course but, you know that and the boat's pretty fast, you know, 56 miles an hour, you know, on the, on the water for a heavy boat like that with all the gear we catch. I can't, I can't complain about that. There's not too many more catfish boats that are faster than that. Yeah. Bet was uh, like 250 pushing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, don't you have, v, is it a V max on it? No, I got a Suzuki. Just oh, Suzuki. V-Max. That's right. Yeah. That um, same black and red color. I kind of forgot. Yeah. It's, I'll leave my comments to myself as far as Suzuki goes, but I mean, I don't know, man. I had a Yamaha before the Merc that's on my Crestliner right now. And the Yamaha was great. It was bulletproof, but I had a Suzuki kicker on it, a 9.9. And it, I mean, that thing was the cat's ass. Quiet, yeah. purred like a sewing machine. And it was great. I haven't had anything bigger than that or ever a Suzuki before that. But you figure with the Yamahas, the Suzukis, the Tahatsu, the Honda, I mean... A guy might think that those four strokes are bulletproof, but yeah, I think, I don't know. And I think in today's age, all the technology is pretty close. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think, you know, very rarely, I, I don't think you can honestly say out of the box up to a certain amount of hours that any of them are probably going to give you a problem. Sure. And if you are buying a new four stroke, obviously there's a warranty for that. You know, sometimes you just get a limit. It just is what it is. It's not yep. really a reflection on the brand or the, uh, you know, the company. Sure. But. All right on, man. Well, yeah, it's a sweet rig. And Danny's wrap on it is obviously also the cat's ass. Have you scratched oh, yeah, the wrap Danny, yet? Danny is very underpaid for what he does, man. Yeah, big He's time. Super talented guy. Uh, blessed to have him in our corner. Mm-hmm. Um, and him him do that you know I, I when i shot him that idea i said you know i want to do a little bit of yellow i want to do some gray i want to do some black i want to do something different because you don't see a lot of yellow but i don't want it to be big bird yeah know, right like, like loud <laughs> yeah just some accents and he was like oh, okay and uh i said he said well i'll get on it and i'll get back to you and i'm expecting to hear something from him in like a week or two weeks you know what i mean yeah 30 minutes later he said go check your email uh, oh, one second, my daughter. I'm out of here. You need to be asleep anyway. <laughs> yep. Mine are, mine are all locked in the bedroom upstairs. They know better. <laughs> well, I think she was supposed to be locked in there. I'm not sure how she got out. But, That'll happen. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, for anybody listening that doesn't know who we're talking about or why we're talking about him, uh, our buddy Danny Christensen, um, he actually started out uh, on as a frequent viewer of my YouTube channel, was always on the live streams, was always leaving comments, um, and then we befriended each other on Facebook. And then um, his last year, maybe even the year before, I don't know, he he made me a bunch of decals for, for the first uh, Kansas City Fishing Expo and just gave them to me. And I bought a shitload from him since then because I burned through those things like you wouldn't believe, but... Super good dude, uh, DC Sign Graphics. If anybody out there is looking for somebody to do print work, like a boat wrap, truck wrap, signage, uh, decals, I mean, you name it, he can do it. And like Adam was saying, he's an absolute wizard and a magician with that stuff because he was actually, he was going to wrap my Crestliner. You inspired me. I hit him up. I was like, hey, let's kick around the idea of a wrap. And I sent him pictures. And then the very next day, I put the order in for my Lund and then he stopped responding. So, <laughs> cause we're not going to wrap the crest liner now, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, super good dude. That Danny yeah. guy. Well, I'll segue that real quick into, um, I want to talk about the, the cat masters deal. Cause I was trying to read a lot about that. And obviously I wish this was a live situation so I could pull up the video that those guys posted when they were in your boat <laughs> where you're cutting the skipjack. <laughs> And you go back to make a cast, and what did you say? You said, "I think this is gonna work out real well." Yeah, and then yeah, like, 
<laughs> right on the swing, it gets caught in the net. Oh my god! I think that was I think that was the most humorous part of that because I was just so confident. Like I was like, "Man, this is gonna work out great. We got good flow." Oh, so good. And totally just bombed it real quick. Oh my god! And you're like, don't don't put you better cut that out. Don't put that in there. <laughs> yeah, god, of that course, was so funny. They had to put that there. But um, yeah, t- tell me about the format. Because like I said, I was trying to read about it. And then I was like, well, it would just be a better question to just ask you. Because this would be like the very first major league fishing, like catfish situation. I mean, like that's history kind of stuff right there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, tournament catfishing has been around a while. Um, we just haven't recently in social media, you know, good and bad here has brought into light and made it more popular than it was. You know, more people are talking about it. More people are doing it. It's cool to do it now, you know. Um, and with that, you know, the catfish tournaments have grown and grown and grown. The payouts have gotten progressively bigger. I think the biggest payout to date at this point is $125,000 payout, um, which is small to some some other sports and you know, some sure. other arenas, but sure. the catfish and that's, that's big money. You know, yeah. I don't care who you are. $125,000 is life changing money. Yeah. Big time. It uh, is, you know, uh, so it, it's progressively growing and really you have about, I would say two, and this isn't to offend anybody that's watching. You probably have two heavy hitters as far as tournament scene goes. And that would be the Cabela's King Cat and the Cat Masters. And, yep. and prior, everybody's been doing the team thing. Because usually how the team thing comes about is it's state law. Obviously, you can only have so many overs, just like any fish that's right. you know regulated. Yep. So obviously, you need two anglers in a boat to weigh in two overs. And that's how that kind of typically comes about. So they came up with this idea to just do something totally different. And they've kind of guidelined certain things they've done like the bass world would. And not Mm -hmm. saying that they're trying to copy the bass world, but obviously the bass world has kind of laid the foundation for mainstream fishing in general. Right. Yeah. It's just a model to work from. Yeah, exactly. So they came up with this idea and I'm not sure really what gave them the idea to do it. Um, but they're in the very beginning stages of, of planning the tour, the actual pro tour, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's a different format that you don't have to have a team. You just, you're, it's just you and your ability and your camera guy or your marshal, Mm -hmm. um, total weight, just like you have in the MLF, which of course they went back to five fish way in now. What was it? What was it before? It was total as many as you could catch. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, okay. I so that's we were kind of the about format. Yeah, that's kind of the format that they're going to do now. It's just, just your total weight. Right. You catch as many fish as you possibly can, over yep. five pounds, of course. Yeah. Um, just because those are kind of difficult to weigh and mm-hmm. net. Um, but it's, it's definitely an interesting format. And with the production behind it, you know, having the camera guy on the boat or your marshal whichever you want to call him, um, it definitely draws a lot more hype. It, it gets people excited about the anglers, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. um, and, it, and I think, you know, you have the TikTok phase right now. You know, of course, YouTube's still relevant. Um, but you don't have – the thing with the catfishing guys is you don't have a lot of good tournament guys that have good social media accounts. Yep. It's you don't have a Scott true. Martin, you know, you don't have a Gerald Swindell. Yep. And I think with the Cabela's King cat and the, uh, the MLT cat masters format with their production side of things and bringing that, that show to other platforms, um, like the pursuit channel, all the mm-hmm. social media accounts. I think it'll start to grow the actual tournament anglers uh, and, and become, you know, you're going to give guys a, a household name. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you'll start to develop those characters, those Gerald Swindells and, and, you know, Roland Martins and stuff like that. Sure. And where people will talk about them. You know, yep. they'll know who they are. Um, so it's all good stuff. And I think right now they're laying bricks. You know, mm-hmm. we're laying the foundation right now. We're digging footers, per se. I think another 10 years, um, well, I say you can't make a living off of catfish, and I make a living off of catfish now, but I think you could see tournament guys making a living off of tournament fishing. Sure. Um, I, I think it's going there. It's it's exciting. Uh, and I'm just – I'm glad to be a part of the, the foundation. You know, to me, that was that was an honor. That was that was a big deal to be invited to that because it was invite. I didn't apply for it or anything else. They came to me. Um, so that was a big deal to me. Uh, that was pretty cool. No, like I said before, man, that's like history making yeah. type stuff, like big, big moves in the fishing oh, yeah. industry for, I don't care if you care about catfish or not. Um, when I saw that initial post from you, like with that funny clip, that's why I was like, wait, this is actually a thing. Yeah. And I was like, this is like seriously badass. And yeah. I don't even know if all of my catfish buddies here know about it. I'm sure they probably do, but you know, that. I, I want to see household names in that in that side of the the industry because like you said there's really not unless you're friends with people like yourself like me where I'm like Adam Cook is a household name. Yeah, that guy catches well, a shitload of big fish and he takes amazing pictures and his his social media accounts get blown out of control and I mean that's just like so but then the other side of it is like you get really good sticks like we might have here in Kansas and Missouri and they can barely form a complete sentence on social media. You know what I mean? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. No offense to those Uh, guys. I mean, sometimes neither can I, but (laughs) you you know what I mean? Or they catch a bunch of big fish. They don't post about it. They don't fish tournaments or maybe they do, but there's, there's several guys that I can think of off the top of my head that are, they've been doing it longer than I've probably been alive and they're, you can never count them out at these tournaments. And everybody that fishes tournaments, you know who the fountains are. You know who the massingales are. But that's only because I actually fish tournaments. You mm-hmm. don't know who they are, you know, right. because they don't have, you know, successful social media accounts. So I think, you know, the thing is, is some of those guys would probably do good on platforms. They would probably yep. do okay if you got them to talk, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they just – they grew up in a different time, a different era where, yep. you know, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks sometimes. It is truly. And that, you know, those are like guys that I wish I could help out. Be like, I'm your guy. I'm your social yeah. media guy. Let me just post yeah. stuff. Cause I, I like posting pictures of fish and yeah. or boats or sunrises <laughs> or sunset. But yeah, no man, that, that, um, is super cool. I'm excited to see what the future holds for that as far as the catfishing goes. And I know I can count on you to see it all and uh, be there for it. How did, so I guess that was the one thing that I did not see was how did you do? We did not do great. Um, and where was, where was this uh, too? just let the people know it was Tennessee river. This was on the Tennessee river, lower yeah. Tennessee river and how they did it this go round. And it, it won't always be like this. Cause like I said, they're laying bricks right now. Um, but they had from Gunnersville to Wilson Lake, for those of you that are familiar with the lower Tennessee river chain, um, that you could fish and had access to. And that day in particular, so we had, of course, your typical spring weather where nothing is ever consistent. And we had on Thursday, this one system come through totally opposite from what the rest of the week had been. It had been sunny and beautiful. Thursday rolled around. It was overcast, cloudy, windy, rainy. Um, excuse me. That came in Thursday night. Friday was the day that it was actually blowing in. So we went out and we, we of course, pre-fished. And I told my guy that was with me, I said, you know, today's probably going to be tough. But if we can just build on what we've been doing, and build a little bit more of a uh, portfolio of what we got going on here, I think would be okay. And even if we don't get the bites, but we see the fish, you just can't, we can't, I can't let that get in my head today, you Mm -hmm. know, because it's probably going to be a tough bite. And we actually went out there and we did really, really well. 
Uh, everywhere I went, I caught fish and I said, okay, well, I think I got something going for me. You know, uh, if I caught them today, I know I'm going to catch, surely I'm going to catch them tomorrow. That should be the better day. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, game day. So if you know anything about the Tennessee river, is it that portion starts up here and it runs down um, and then kind of loops back up and dumps into the Mississippi over here. Wilson mm -hmm. Lake is way down here. You have these other lakes that are accessible up here. Well, that front, something again happened with the, the wind or the pattern, and it got pushed a little bit further south um, when that wind turned back around and started coming out of the south. We had another front that came right behind it. It was a warm front. And it affected Wilson Lake before it affected these northern lakes up there. And when I say lakes, I don't know how many people know the difference, like I said, but just for simplistic people that don't know. Yeah. From Wilson Lake to Gunnersville, it's probably about two hours and 30 minutes. I mean, it's, it's a hike up there. Well, that front blew in in the morning, and it just shut that lake down. And I'm not the one that usually – I'm always a firm believer I can find a fish – feeding somewhere yep me too uh <laughs> me too. i you i don't have the luxury of not believing that yep. you know and i'm too stubborn to you know convince me otherwise but i'm gonna tell you i covered just about every part of that lake you could cover and uh i just didn't have it that day just nothing that i pre-fished nothing that i practiced all week worked and materialized for us and that's really the only good excuse that i got um it the only thing I can think is that front came through and it, it just made things tough down there because them guys up north, it didn't affect them. They sure. caught fish all day. And yep. everybody that fished Wilson, nobody caught anything. So you mean to tell me all them other guys are just as bad as a fisherman as I am? Yeah. You know? So, wow. I, you know, I think just whatever it was, that front just kind of shut that lake down. And the distance between those lakes, even if you lock through, you would have spent so much time riding. That's your whole day. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it is what it is. I was blessed um, for the opportunity. It was a blast. And you bet. I will definitely be on the circuit in the future. Um, I'll probably commit to every single one of those. Sure. But, you know, even though it sets a nice professional tone, you know, <laughs> like that little clip you're talking and we were talking about earlier about being a little bit too professional sometimes. So sometimes mm -hmm. being silly and just being yourself, you know, pays off more as far as is, is a following standpoint and getting numbers uh, than being professional sometimes. Right. You know, that one clip, I think it's at like 300,000 views right now. It is because I checked right before we got on this. <laughs> it, it's, it's, crazy. it's quite a bit of hits. And I, I know that has nothing to do with exactly what we we're saying, but. I wanted to kind of circle back around that, you know, just being yourself and being genuine sometimes gets you a little bit further than, you know, trying to be something that you're not necessarily. Yep. It's way easier to just be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Absolutely. But man, that clip is so funny. I mean, why would like, I'm sure 10,000 of those views are probably just for me the last few days. Cause I could watch that over and it wouldn't get any less funny. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I watched it a couple of times myself. I said, I cannot believe that I just did that. Well, the, I think the best part about that too, is like just going back to everything that you were explaining that it was a tough day, probably already in your head and frustrated or flustered or i mean at least to a point not to a fault and then that happens on camera and you're just like why don't you just throw me in the river too at this rate yeah <laughs> that was good stuff yeah i'm not gonna lie about 2 30 i was thinking back and i know you're not the the creator of it um uh, i believe jordan jordan lee came up with that slogan that this oh this slogan sucks. sucks i'm not gonna yeah, lie about i got that from his website that's one of his hoodies I was going to say about two 30. I just, that popped up that picture that you posted. And I said, this fucking lake sucks. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it really it. does. Uh, and I'm watching the number, you know, cause the whole time I have access on the tablet to see what everybody else is doing. I That's yep. You that's know, huge. So I'm watching and I'm looking at the numbers and I'm like, nobody on Wilson is doing anything. And I'm watching these guys on Gunnersville, 20, 30, 50, 
another 50, a third. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I think well, um, uh, what I just looked at it here just a second ago, the first place was like 236 pounds or something yeah. like that. So, I mean, even though they did substantially better, really, in reality, I know this is hard for a lot of people to fathom. That's really not that good. Truly. You know, no, for sure. But it was, I think for me, it was just seeing first place versus the other weights where it was like mid to lower double digits up to a triple digit. Like it seems like a lot, but for that yeah. fisher, yeah, I totally see how that's not even that much. In comparison, and this isn't a, isn't a stretch, I really felt confident that we would have dropped 500 pounds that day um, based off of what we were catching pre-fish wise. Mm-hmm. Um, I really felt like 500 was doable. I, you know, I didn't know if that was going to win, but I felt like that would put us in contention and it would have made a good, really good show. Yep. Nonetheless. Yep. Um, it just didn't work out like that for us that day. Nope. But, but and that's okay because like you said, just blessed to be a part of it and you know, be a part of the, a part of the bricks laying the foundation to a circuit like that yeah. in an industry that uh, really needed something like that. For yeah. sure. Yeah. It was very, very cool to be a part of. Yep. Well, I'll be looking forward to it, but um, we're probably knocking on the door of like an hour and change here. And I know since you're on the East coast, it's a little bit later and it's getting late for me too. Cause I got to turn around and get stuff ready for tomorrow morning for tomorrow's grind trip and uh, yeah. some more big East wind, at least no rain, but um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of taking it easy. I just ate dinner. And uh, my wife walked in and she said, uh, don't you have a podcast to get ready for? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what time is it? And I said, she said, it's nine o'clock. And I was like, oh, oh, yeah, I do, actually. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of getting a little tired. I was like, I wonder if he's going to cancel. We can do this another night. But either way, I'm glad, glad we got to sit down and talk. And even though through the screen, we actually got to meet. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me on here. And. I look forward to watching the rest of them. Yep, me too, man. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing this again at some point soon too because I got a lot more I want to talk about and I want to hear a lot more stories from uh, those big old catfish on the East Coast because I'm enthralled by it and I think it's cool and I think it'll be good for uh, my audience to hear too um, just from a perspective of somebody who, if what we, we say they're sport fish, people don't consider them sport fish is what you were saying earlier. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, you know, well, I'll say this, the smaller under 15 pounds, I totally agree that those fish are technically a trash fish. Sure. They're not necessarily mature enough to eat live fish on the move. Will they eat it if they can eat it? Yes, absolutely. But yeah. they'd be just as happy as eating that piece of bubble gum wrapper over there because yeah. <laughs> You know, they don't That's know hilarious. any better. So they are a trash fish, but these these larger fish, man, and as far as in North America, there is not a more dominant apex species, in my opinion, when it comes to the trophy end of the yep. you know to the trophy end of the spectrum. I mean, these fish are the biggest and baddest things that swim in whatever body of water there is. Yep. And, you know, that rubs people the wrong way, too, because then they complain that they're eating all the bluegill or they're mm -hmm. eating all the bass or they're doing this. They're, you know how it goes. Yeah. Um, but it, it is what it is. You know, these fish now have been stocked because blues are not native here. And I'm not going to go on and on and on, but right. they were actually stocked back in the late 70s here. Okay. They've been here 50 some years now. They have every bit of right to be here as anything else. Absolutely. Um, you know, and the people that don't like catfish typically are the people that have never caught a 50 pound catfish. Yeah, that is before. very true. Yes. You know, <laughs> I would it's kind of, it's, it's easy to talk about something when you have, haven't experienced it, you know, that's um, right. I'm right but, there with you. Well, that's a good note to leave it on one for the haters who might be listening that, uh, maybe we're not convinced that big blues and big catfish are. Uh, at the top of the food chain and there they stay. So oh, once yeah. again, man, really appreciate you uh, taking the time out to do this and I'm looking forward to do it again soon. And uh, as always, I'll be following along. So um, if you got any social media you want to plug, we can send you off with that. Your Facebook, Instagram, 
I know you're a big TikToker, so make sure you drop that in there. Yeah, pretty much all of our social media accounts is either under Adam Cook or Nautical Pride Sport Fishing. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'd really love to get back into YouTube. We do have some content up there. It's just I'm not super consistent with posting stuff right now, and hopefully in the next year that'll change. But you can find us there as well and see a little bit about what we do firsthand. And uh, if you want to take a trip with us, be sure to give us a call. That All that links and all that stuff's in the uh, comments. Yep. I will, I will have all that. Uh, I will have all that information in the description too. So people can get in touch. Definitely a destination fishery and I'll be out there at some point. You can guarantee it. Absolutely. We look forward to it, man. All right. Thanks Adam. Well, it was so good talking to you and, uh, hope everyone listening enjoyed the episode. We'll see you on the next one. And Adam, don't forget you don't own the lake. That's right. See you buddy. Take care.